Good morning! I'm the Reverend Amy Richter and I am here with the Reverend Dr. Joseph Pagano on top of Gross Morn Mountain in Gross Morn National Park in Newfoundland. And this is a service of morning prayer for Sunday, October 31st. Thank you so much for joining us today. Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Venite. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. A reading from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Milan and Chilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Milan and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This is Rejoice, the Lord is King. In our junior praise, it's number 379. <laughs>
A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When, see, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In our gospel lesson, Jesus gives us the greatest commandment that we should love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we should love our neighbors as ourselves. This command is one of Jesus's most well-known statements, which in a strange way also makes it one of his most complicated. People have commented that this command to love God and to love neighbor is one of those familiar phrases that is easy to say, but hard to do. Or perhaps it's not the familiarity that makes it complicated, but is rather just the nature of Jesus's teaching. Simple enough for a child to understand but also so deep that it takes a lifetime just to scratch the surface. Or perhaps the challenge is that our ideas about love in 21st century North America, so influenced as they are by popular culture, love is a many splendor thing, love is all you need, are really quite different from Jesus's first century ideas about love. So this well-known saying of Jesus is complicated, easy to say, but hard to do. 
simple but profound, familiar, and also strange. So this morning, I want to talk about some of the ways this command to love God and to love neighbor is both simple and complicated. Now, I cannot possibly say all that needs to be said about this passage. I'll just try to note a few ways this beautiful passage is both simple and complicated. The first thing to note is that for Jesus, the love of God and the love of neighbor is a commandment. That is, love is not something that we simply feel, but it is also something we are called to do. Now, in our day, we often think of love as something we simply feel, an emotion or an affection that we have for someone or something. For Jesus, love is this, but also a whole lot more. We will recall that Jesus talks about love in a discussion with one of the scribes about the greatest commandment. Now, this apparently was a familiar topic of conversation among Jewish teachers of the day who were often asked to respond to the question, which one of all the laws or commandments from the Old Testament was the greatest or the most important? One Jewish rabbi, Hillel, was once asked to teach the whole of the law while standing on one foot. And he famously replied, that which is hateful to you, do not do to others. The rest is commentary. So Jesus has asked this very typical question about the greatest of all the Old Testament laws. And he gives this response about the love of God and the love of neighbor. And Jesus's response is really just two quotations from the Old Testament. The command to love God is from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And the command to love our neighbor is from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. So Jesus is saying that of all the hundreds of commandments found in the Old Testament, these two are of first importance. There are at least a couple important takeaways from this. If love of God and love of neighbor is a commandment, then it is not simply about how we feel about them, but rather also includes what we do in relationship to them. Love of God is manifest and strengthened in our lives when we do things like worship and pray and serve. And love of neighbor is more than my friendly feelings, but also about the ways I treat them as persons deserving of honor, dignity, and respect. It also means that Jesus wasn't saying that love somehow eliminates all the other laws found in the Old Testament. Love of God and love of neighbor are of first importance, but that doesn't mean that things like honor your father and your mother, don't lie, cheat, or steal aren't important commandments as well. They just find their importance and place relative to the love commandments. It's as simple and as complicated as that. A second thing to note is that Jesus's commandment that we should love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength is also a bit more complicated than it may seem at first. To say that we should love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength is, I take it, 
a way of saying that our love of God should include everything about ourselves. Jesus is calling for a total commitment of the whole person to God. Everything that we are and everything that we do should be an expression of our love of God. Which is a radical and somewhat overwhelming thing if we think about it. Love of God is not just about the part of me that goes to the church on Sundays and says my, and says my prayers at nighttime, but about everything that I say and do. What I eat, purchase, give, forgive, laugh about, cry about, accept with patience, protest with, pro with prophetic anger, and so on, are all supposed to be about my love of God. It's almost impossible when I begin to think about it. And it doesn't seem right to try to solve this by saying that we are called to love God and not care about anything else. Because Jesus clearly says, we should also love our neighbor. The real issue, many people have said, is how we rightly order our loves. When we love God first, then all our other loves fall into place. When we put something that is less than God first, then everything gets out of whack. So, perhaps this commandment about loving God with heart, soul, mind, and strength is about how to rightly order our human loves, which I think makes a certain amount of sense. There are, of course, cases in human history and society where people have chosen to love things that are simply bad or evil. And this, of course, is clearly wrong. But in my experience, in dealing with people who go to church regularly, this is not really the challenge they are facing. Rather, it seems to be more about the struggle to get the right priorities or order among all the good things that we love. For example, for myself, I don't think there's anything wrong with my love of, say, the Green Bay Packers or fishing or spending time with my friends. But if I end up spending so much of my time on these things that I end up neglecting my wife and my family and my job and my religious life, then something is probably wrong. Jesus seems to be saying that God and God alone should be our ultimate love, the center of all our lives and all our loves. If we get this right, then everything else falls into place. Or as St. Augustine famously put it, love God and then do what you will. It's as simple and as complicated as that. A third thing to note is that the command to love our neighbor as ourselves is also more complicated than it appears at first. In one sense, Jesus' command to love our neighbor is clear enough in saying that we ought to show the same care and concern we have for ourselves to our neighbors as well. But when we start to think more deeply about it, a number of questions arise. Who is my neighbor? Is it only the people who happen to live near me and I happen to enjoy spending time with? 
We know from other passages in the Gospels that Jesus thinks of our neighbors as widely as possible, including people like Samaritans, and telling us that we should love our enemies. It seems like love of neighbor includes everyone for Jesus. No exceptions. But when we expand the concept of neighbor so widely, the command to love them as ourselves becomes even more complicated. Think about it. How do I make sense of the as myself part of neighbor love? For example, if I really love fishing, is it actually a loving thing to do to plan a fishing outing for my wife if she in fact is grossed out by the very thought of fishing? This is a silly example, but you get the point. If I am to rightly love my neighbor as myself, it can't simply be a matter of foisting my loves onto others without any consideration of what they care about. But at the other extreme, love of neighbor can't really be about trying to give my neighbor anything and everything they happen to desire. For another silly but real example, when I was a child, my parents did not let me eat pizza and ice cream for every meal, even though that was very much what I desired. And the fact that they didn't give me these things was precisely the way they would claim they were showing love and care for me. So, loving my neighbor as myself must somehow avoid these extremes of foisting what I love on people regardless of who they are and of trying to give people anything and everything they desire. And it is here that I think the command to love God first helps out. If God is God and God is first, then you and I and everybody else find their true value, honor, and dignity in relationship to God and God's purposes. I love myself rightly and I love my neighbor rightly when this priority of God is in place. Loving our neighbors as ourselves is a way in which we help each other to grow into the people we are made to be by our good and loving God. It's as simple and as complicated as that. So, in response to the question of which commandment was the greatest, Jesus said we should love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Love is a commandment. It's as much about our doing as it is about our feeling. The first commandment is to love God above all else, for God's self alone, and to love all other things in relationship to God. And the second commandment tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to love them in such a way that we help each other to grow into the people God would have us to be. It's as simple and as complicated as that. Amen. In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone, for this community, our country, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth, for John, our bishop, 
and for all bishops and other ministers, for all who serve God in his church, for our own needs and those of others. We pray especially for Sadie, Doug, Noreen, Sean, Kim, Doug, Faye, Connie, Deanna, Stuart, Herb, Joe, Dorcas, Marilyn, Barbara, Connor, Irving, Joan, Marion, Debbie, and also for Melvin, Denise, Glenn, Audrey, Diane, Cecil, George, Shirley, Janelle, Clarence, John, Anne, Audrey, Donna, Eileen, Dave, Suzanne, Brayden, Cody, Penny, Danielle, Sean, Byron, Howard, BJ, and Dee Dee, and any others you wish to name aloud or silently. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all those who have died in the peace of Christ and for those whose faith is known to you alone, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. Gracious God, you have heard the prayers of your faithful people. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Grant our requests as may be best for us. This we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and always. Amen.
in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.